How do you test to make sure each individual module works? Uh, so testing works by connecting everything, plugging it in, and then our first test is to see if any smoke appears. If no smoke appears, we test if anything gets hot. And if nothing of that happens, we check if the functionality works by trying it out. And then it either works or we give up. Hello everybody, how's everybody doing? Uh, thanks so much for stopping by. I've been streaming the past uh, week just quietly on Twitch and so after a week, after I realized it kind of got a little bit more consistent, uh, I decided to announce it on the main channel. So uh, thanks so much for stopping by. And already thanks uh, Kudo Pharma, Energizer and Eraser for the uh, Twitch Prime subscriptions. So, um, for all the, obviously everybody's basically new in here. I've been streaming to like 30 to 50 people or so uh, the past few weeks. So now we are so many more people. So I definitely want to give a quick introduction again, uh, more um, uh, w what we are doing here. As you can also see from the stream title, this is already the eighth uh, incarnation of this stream. Like I said, I streamed the past week. So we, m we already made some progress. But uh, as mentioned in the announcement video, I have uploaded the stream archive on Live Overflow 2. And of course, the VOD is also available on Twitch uh, if you check the videos. And on Live Overflow 2, I have also created kind of like super cut highlight videos uh, that are just like 30 minutes to an hour long instead of three to four hours uh, in case you want to catch up. Or just watch the original video series uh, by Ben Eder, which is absolutely uh, amazing. So um, this whole series is based on uh, Ben Eater's 8-bit computer that he built on breadboards. You can find his website, eater.net, or find his YouTube channel, uh, Ben Eater. So I'm following along. I'm here to learn how a computer works, um, learn a bit more about electronics, and just get a bit more experience with that. Uh, and so hopefully we can learn together. So that's why it's not really security related. But I mean, understanding, comp as, as I always preach, I think at the core of hacking is always trying to understand computers and technology better. And I think this is, for example, one of these projects that might not directly be related to working in the field and earning money or whatever, and a skill that necessarily you really need if you do uh, application security. But I think it does help uh, by providing just more context of uh, what computers are about. Uh, I cannot keep up on chat anymore. Holy crap. OK, wait, let me quickly. This is so different from just 50 viewers. Right, and so basically for today's stream, we will continue connecting the ALU to the registers. S just to give you an idea, yet, uh, on Friday we had a stream that was about four hours long and we just managed to connect eight wires to these. So let's see how productive we will be today. Um, my expectations are low and so should be yours. Um, are you Michael Sarah? By the way, clip that. Uh, if you are clipping stuff, that is actually really helpful for me when I create like a highlights thing. I I can see the times where things were clipped in the in the stream, so it's very easy for me to cut out stuff or a thing. I'm German. It's a Lichtbildausweis. Isn't that as German as it gets? Well, <laughs> do you think I'm Michael Sarah? Of course not. Of course it's a joke. Why does it say Canadian? Because I decided to print it on there. It's just a plastic card. You can print anything you want on a plastic card. It's not It's not a government thing. It's just a plastic card. And because people kept are saying for years that I sometimes look like Michael Sierra. So I made this actually six years ago or so, I think. In 2012, I believe I made that. So maybe even, yeah, well, in December. Why is my English so well? Um, uh, multiple reasons. 
when I was in school, I was terrible at English, but later in school, I started to watch TV shows in English. So How I Met Your Mother was like a huge thing for me and my friends. And we always wanted to be up to date. So we watched it in English, obviously. So starting to watching TV shows and movies in English was a huge help. Um, also work started to be just be more English. University started to be more English just because computer stuff is always English. And then I also uh, met my girlfriend uh, who is half American. And so I've been uh, talking with her English, English exclusively, basically. And, uh, that, and that improved my English very well. It's not as good as I want it to be. And my German has deteriorated extremely. But I'm, I'm quite happy. I think my English is quite, quite okay. I still want to get rid of some of my German accent. But it's not too bad, I think. On a scale between 1 and 10, how bad does the 35C3 band smell by now? It's cloth. It is washed when I shower, so it doesn't smell at all. But I keep it as vaccination, you know? Expose yourself to uh, stuff. Uh, is there a job in cybersecurity that doesn't involve a lot of traveling? I am never traveling. I just sit at home. So, but yeah, that's actually a reason why I don't so I'm quite lucky with my with the way how I'm working that I don't have to travel to clients, but I know that the industry generally is involves a lot of travel. Most pen testers and stuff have to go constantly on site or at least go to the client to present or do the kickoff meetings and stuff like this. I'm glad I don't have to do this. If I wouldn't have the job I have right now and I would have to get a pen testing job that involves travel like this, I would probably actually not do it and I would probably become a developer. I don't think that being a developer is such a worst job either. I think actually working is, if, if working is fun or not, depends less on your job title or what exactly you do, but also the more, more, more so the environment and your team. And I think there are amazing companies that do development. And maybe you can be a force of security in there too, you know, maybe ask if you can spend like 30% of your time on code reviews or s some testing, put a security hat on, you know, there are always options to do a bit more security then. Yeah, so, so this is where I more see my alternative rather than doing some kind of travel consulting stuff. I'm pretty sure forgery is still not allowed. It's not forgery. What is forged? This is not, not, not an official document. What are you talking about? There's nothing forged. Uh, what's my master thesis about? Don't judge me. I need a disclaimer, everybody. I mention it. It's about blockchain stuff. I'm not interested in any cryptocurrencies. I'm not advocating for it. I think all of it is a scam. Don't invest your money into it. I'm doing a master thesis because I want to break that stuff, not because I want to build that stuff so okay what would have been your career if it wasn't IT um, I always like to tinker and stuff so maybe I would have gone into like uh, the German term is Maschinenbau um, industrial engineering is that maybe the English equivalent maybe something of building like maybe industrial machines or something like this uh, maybe do you think blockchain is a good technology on its own? Sure, it's an interesting technology and maybe there are good applications. I don't think that there are many applications and it's definitely not equivalent to the hype right now, but sure, I mean, it's a de technical solute. It's a technical tool that might be able to solve something, you a problem you have. So, you know, yeah, blockchain itself is cannot really be valued. It's if you use it for as a good solution for something. Um, and specifically, I do about smart contracts. And so I find smart contracts fun because it's a weird execution environment, similar to a stupid 8-bit computer with a weird instruction set that is extremely limited. Why am I interested in this? Just because I'm interested in it, because it's an interesting execution environment. And yeah. What do you do for self-motivation? Uh, I just do what I feel want to do. But I have to say, the one one small reason for doing the stream uh, is the same reason also why I do the you keep doing the YouTube channel 
having some other incentives at play can help me be motivated. So if I would build this on my own, I might get bored at some point or abandon it, but having it attached now to the stream, this can be a way to motivate myself. So maybe you can start a blog and document your progress of learning something. When you play CTFs, do write-ups on your blog, share it on Twitter. Uh, not only uh, can this be kind of like a way to, um, you know, motivate yourself by doing that, but it can also build your resume already. You have something that you can show to an employee when you apply somewhere, they have something to see. Maybe you can even build a small following on Twitter with a couple of uh, like 100 followers or so. So you have a, already a bit of a social uh, network in your field of expertise. So stuff like this, I would recommend. I found the best way to stay productive is to have two to three different projects active one time and you never be in the mood for all of them, but you usually can switch between them. Yeah, that's basically also what I have. This is a project. My YouTube videos are constantly small new projects. Every new video is a small project that I have. Uh, it takes multiple days to make. Um, I have small coding projects that I'm still doing. I'm still working like on a website. Um, uh, and of course I have my work as well, which is super fun. I have my master thesis. I have a lot of stuff going on. Show us your drawing tablet. Uh, it's over here. I'm not sure if I can get it onto the screen because it's pretty far away. It's just this. It's just a basic Wacom drawing tablet. See the shiny part here? I'm basically always only drawing in that area here. You basically can see the uh, the oh my gosh! You can really see the rectangle. This is basically the rectangle in Photoshop uh, where I do my overlay drawings. Uh, so this is the only drawing area. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. I have a live I have a long live stream recording on Live Overflow main channel. It's like 14 hours where I edit a whole Live Overflow episode um from start to finish or like how how the whole process works in case you are wondering. What happened to the flare camera? Uh it doesn't work. I initiated the return and I ordered a new one. Should arrive on Tuesday. Join me on Tuesday for an unboxing stream and hopefully a non-broken flare camera. Oh, I was confused. And so again, no important mind. to, you know, look at the the pinout of the of the adders and make sure you're connecting output one, output two, output three, output four, and so forth in order. Is it your airplane? Are you rich? Yeah, it's my staff that's just arriving. Sorry about that. Will you give it more RAM like a DDR4? I doubt we will ever be able to interface with the DDR4 RAM. We still keep the 600 viewers. Yeah, that's quite insane. Some people must have left the tab open and forgot about it. Oh, I just noticed that I ordered and received the parts for a 4-bit breadboard. What is a 4-bit breadboard computer? What did you build or what do you want to build? Okay, okay, so let's connect these. Um, as he mentioned here, we need to make sure that we connect the output. So the output, as far as I remember, were these uh, sigma, these E sigmas here. So uh, down here in the corner where my face is right now, uh, this. so this is the first output, second output, third and fourth. And then we are hooking that up to the uh, output chip. Uh, what is an ALU? It's an arithmetic logic unit. So it's the unit, the component in the CPU that performs arithmetic operations. In our case, addition, but as well as subtraction. How does he make the cables go in such nice corners? We spent four hours on eight cables with a lot of patience and bending. Uh, we can make it look like that. Why don't you give Ben your parts list to add to the website? Why do you assume Ben wants my part list on, on his website? You can buy the, in the part, it's the same part list. It, in my part list, I just have links to the German store. Uh, you can still just go through Ben Eater's parts list and type it into any store you want to order from. Shouldn't he write a master thesis? Don't make me feel bad. Okay. The first chip uh, to the A1s. I guess, um, I, like I said, I'm not quite sure about like the order and stuff of, of these things right now, of the bit order. Uh, 
But I guess that's just what it is. Whatever. Why do you not simply use a box cutter knife? And a lot of people have mentioned box cutter. I, okay, to be honest, I haven't really tried it yet. To me, it seems like way worse, but maybe we can try it, I guess. I feel like this is worse, but I don't know. Wait, where's the original chips? Um, those chips are memory chips. Uh, so these are basically memory chips. These are de uh, registers, but everything else is actually not memory chips. They are like logic gates. So these ones are adders. They implement four bit addition. These one implement, I guess, four bit XOR. Uh, up here we have a chip that can use is a timer chip that can output a clock. Um, up here we have what was that again? Oh, these are actually regular like gates. They're, I'm not sure which one was which, but we have a a not gate and an inverting gate, an AND gate and an OR gate if I remember correctly up here. Um, and these ones are like tri-state chips that can like connect or disconnect uh, a line that we use for output. So. This is also something I had to learn when I when I checked out hardware for the first time that these black chips are not like I don't know, like what are these black chips? They are not really memory or anything. They are actually you know they implement different kind of logic circuits, and um, they might just be gates or they might be something more complex. The chips you see here are actually kind of very old. So the, these chips are called seven four or seven. 400, 7,400 or so. It's a series of chips and they go back a couple of decades. So in modern hardware, you usually don't really see them anymore, I would say. Um, but I'm not so sure. I, it's not like I build electronics as a full living, so I don't know if they get still used. I mean, you can still buy them, so I guess they are still used. Maybe for like small custom electronics components and stuff like this. Okay, so input A is up here, so we cut here. Under what flight path are you? Uh, these are my private chats for my staff, so it's not like an official flight path. I, I can't believe that still 500 viewers are consistently here. I'm really curious later on the statistics that Twitch offers, that shows me how many like new people are joining in and how many are leaving. I wonder if it's like a constant, continuous trickle in right now from the video. Um, or I assume that that must be the best explanation for this. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm curious how much I can retain in terms of uh, followers. What are your opinions on emulation and dynamic recompiling? Would you consider doing a video about it? Uh, I, I mean, I don't have an opinion about that. I don't think that there can be opinions. It's, it's a tool that can be used to solve certain problems. And if, it, if you can use it to solve a certain problem for you, perfect. Uh, it's definitely an interesting topic. Um, if I had an interesting problem that I would solve with that, um, I would definitely make a video about this. But you know, I don't just want to make a video explaining something. I want to actually show generally how stuff is used and what kind of problems it can solve. From this angle, you look a bit like my Kazera. Uh, this again. Okay, so we have connected four wires in like 20 minutes or so. That must be a record. You should put it under category science. I thought about that, but just chatting is a way bigger category. And also we are chatting a lot. And also, I don't know, I'm experimenting, you know. I, you know, on in the category science and science and technology, or even the programming stuff, only people go there that want to see that. Uh, I hope that I can, you know, reach people that are not necessarily into computers or electronics or security that just stumble in here, think it's kind of nerdy and fun and stay and maybe uh, motivate them to uh, also look into uh, computer stuff more, you know? So if I can, I, I'd rather, I know it would be nicer if I would put it in the category where it kind of belongs, but it's still chatting. We are still chatting a lot. So I think it still is absolutely qualifying for just chatting. And I do hope again that um, then maybe I can, uh, you know, grab some people. Is this a speed run? It's more of a slow run for sure. 
Uh, where do you buy the gray mat? On this is just a cutting mat. This is like for people that do arts and crafts and are cutting like paper with this. You just can find it as a cutting mat. I don't know if it's useful. I think it looks cool as an underground and kind of protects the table, I guess. Is someone hosting Life Overflow? Uh, I'm hosting myself. Um, I, I advertised this stream on my uh, main YouTube channel. So uh, we had at the beginning like 640 viewers or so. And I think people are still like trickling in from that video on uh, the main channel. Uh, so it has quite... Um, I see the statistics here on my other monitor, on my other PC here right now. So that video has gotten so far almost 8,000 views. You know what, you know, okay, just so you can understand kind of the position, how it feels like to be a YouTuber, okay? So I am currently, if you don't know my YouTube channel or whatever, I'm currently running a series on the basics of browser exploitation where very technically I try to understand how the basics of browser exploitation works by looking into one exploit targeting WebKit or Safari. And it's very complicated, it's very technical. It took me, you know, a lot of time to kind of like understand it myself. It, it took years of studying to be able to get to that point that I'm on now and I'm still not fully understanding it, right? I, I'm just learning it right now as well. And so I started creating this series and I worked on these videos. Each video that I'm making takes multiple days to make, not to mention uh, the, the whole research time before that and learning all of that stuff. And I'm currently releasing them every week and I released one today. And these videos are performing very, very badly from the viewer numbers. They are like at the bottom of my last 10, like YouTube shows you like a, an overview of how your last 10 videos have performed. And all of these browser exploitation videos are always at the bottom. They always perform the worst. It's absolutely understandable from the YouTube ecosystem and algorithm form. They are very technical videos. They are very dry. They are only interesting to a small number. Luckily, I'm not dependent on that income for my uh, f like it's not my main job, right? So I don't need to care about that too much. That allows me to keep making very technical videos because I know for the view, for the few people that do watch it, like I would be, like I, um, one motivation for the channel was that those are the kinds of videos that I would like to see. So um, I, th I think it they are the videos that peep that a few people are really glad that I make them and for those people I make them basically I make them for myself right uh, but you know they are not performing well now this announcement video for this stream here that I uploaded is in my last 10 videos my third best video and it's performing it's taking off in views as YouTube uh, describes it um, and it has a higher subscriber interest and stuff like this, right? So that video that I made in like less than an hour, include like the, the recording and the quick editing of that stuff took me like less than an hour, is performing, you know, way, way, way better than my technical videos, right? Just so, you know, I, I don't mind. Like I, I understand the YouTube stuff, you know, I've done this now for three years or so, but just to give you like an, how it, how it feels for some, especially if you, what need to live off that money right if you have a youtube channel and this is your actually job you know think about how that must feel if the videos that you invest crazy amounts of time into and think that are really valuable are not being watched which is nobody's fault it's just of course these videos are kind of not not as engaging and stuff like that uh, and then you upload like a sh crappy announcement video and that video just gets like you know double the amount of views or so and is just performing better you know it's interesting uh sorry for the long rant now i lost track of chat again what about retention so the i mean the, it's very difficult this is was a very short announcement video so the retention is now for this short announcement video obviously not comparable to my 13 minute technical video, but that is actually a good point because while these technical videos are not viewed a lot, they get a lot less view numbers, the retention rate is on average higher than on the other videos because few people watch it because only people that are really interested in it watch it, but then those people actually are really interested in, and engaged and watch this then uh, um, longer. 
it's just so anticlimactic. You see, you see robotics, and then you spend six months on learning theoretical nonsense about robots and actually useful information. Uh, I some I can understand you. I think that the university and our education system has a problem there. I do think the information that is conveyed in these courses is, in principle, extremely important. Uh, on you know on the highest level of education that we have university you should learn the the, the most advanced uh, you know stuff that would allow you to then move on into those companies and then actually you know work on the actual mathematics that push robotics further and further and to do that you need to be able to understand state of the art like math the underlying concepts of you know how you calculate that stuff so I understand that but you know, I think the education system is kind of failing here for not making it more engaging, more examples, more practical. Maybe, you know, have even different kind of degrees, very th longer maybe, you know, do theoretical maybe later, start with more practical intros earlier and stuff. like. I don't know, there are a lot of ways how it could be made differently. You are one of the people that love the browser exploitation series. Thanks. Thanks, yeah. Yeah, and, and that's another thing. I actually get a lot more of messages about this new series that are thanking me for making that browser exploitation series. I don't get that for other videos, especially like my, my big videos, my viral or my most successful videos. I don't get messages like that. But this series that gets viewed almost like gets t viewed terribly compared to my other videos. Here I actually have people reach out and write me emails and say they really enjoyed it and they are grateful for it and you know that 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 feels great as a content creator luckily and as a content creator who doesn't have to care about the money uh, that that is you know the that is actually what I want to achieve right like I said if you if that would be my job that would be terrible okay so we connected here another wire so now we have only two left can I work for you for free absolutely not I refuse to do any free work that's also my issue with like I should add moderators on Twitch chat, uh, for example. But I don't want to have anybody to work for me without being paid. Uh, I think that's very exploitative, and uh, maybe I feel a bit more strongly than other people about this because I'm a freelancer myself, and so you know I maybe I'm a bit more on the extreme side here. But I definitely don't want to have people work for free. I already feel bad for people like Vadim helping we, we helping me with the um, with the for example the mobile phone videos. Ideally, like if I would get if I would be able to get filthy rich of making videos and stuff like like if I could get filthy rich, I would love to pay researchers to tell me their bugs, like you know a bug bounty, but for researchers to share it with me that I can make YouTube videos about it, to pay the researchers for their incredible work and then me be able to share it on YouTube. If I would make a lot of money from videos, I would love to do that. But you know, <laughs> the money is not even enough to pay a salary for me. So uh, yeah, dreaming. I wouldn't really consider Twitch moderating as work, maybe for bigger channels. Yeah, yeah, I, maybe it's not work. I don't know, but I don't know. It feels weird. I really wish it was an actual market for research and education videos. I actually think that there is a market for research and education videos. That's kind of what I tried to do. Um, I just haven't quite figured out what the best way of monetization it is yet. Uh, so the YouTube ads are abysmal. Uh, you know, a video creates maybe like 20 or $30 in the first like two or three months. And then you have like a dollar or so trickling in over time again. You know, like, so YouTube ad money is not enough to finance a video. Uh, Patreon might have the possibility to finance it. It finances already blog posts, you know, like the, so I can take the Patreon money and turn that money basically into additional blog posts. So uh, that is great value. And if I'm able to grow my viewership, uh, then my Patreon might grow as well. And then maybe that would be enough per video to, um, to fund even more and pay researchers uh, for it. And then the other option is obviously to do sponsors and uh, the broad exploitation series is supported by a first company. And if I could be able to do that more, that would be great. The prob the difficulty is just for me, uh, what company do I wanna work with together because there are a lot of products that would pay well, like VPN providers and stuff like that 
for sponsoring, but I refuse to do sponsoring with them. I don't want to do that. Then there are shady companies that do stuff that I find ethically questionable or that are very opposing to my uh, moral views. And so I don't want to advertise them either. Uh, so it gets a bit difficult. And to be honest, I wish I could prefer not to talk to businesses and get advertisement. Uh, ideally, it would just be something like Patreon where people just commit something. I think that would be, that would be my preference. What do you think of VPNs that automatically blacklist IPs and DNS from trackers, like ad trackers? Seems like a cool feature, I guess. Um, I don't know, like, yeah, especially for mobile, I guess it's cool because you can't install a good uh, uh, ad blocker in on mobile. But then again, I don't know, why do you want the VPN to, to track all your connections instead of like Google and Facebook on some of your connections? Yeah, so I don't know. VPN can have a better firewall against DDoS. I guess I personally have never had an issue with DDoS. I don't know if anybody ever tried. Maybe nobody ever tried, but um, like I don't know. It, it, I'm not. I, I hope nobody of you wants will try now. But I don't think that you know it's necessarily such a concern for normal people. If you don't play Minecraft and if you don't play Roblox, you should be fine anyway. You should not pay more for a name like ThinkPad or MacBook. I think that is such a short-sighted answer always. It's not always the price. Like as a professional doing like, you know, work, I don't really care about the price. If a thing helps me do my job, earn, you know, tens of thousands of euros every year, then I use the tool that helps makes me work best. And so I have a MacBook, I have an overpriced high-end level MacBook because it make the touchpad is the best feature of a MacBook. The touchpad is amazing. No other laptop gets close to this kind of touchpad or as far as I don't know. And this touchpad is boosting my productivity and lowers my frustration with dealing with a laptop by immense stuff. And a lot of work is just writing emails, hanging out in chat, researching, browsing the internet and stuff like this. So having a good touchpad and having a nice screen is worth a lot. What if I want to watch porn but do not want ISP to know what I'm that I'm visiting porn website? Why do you want the VPN provider to know that you visit a porn website? I don't know. Just watch porn, it's normal. How do you make your wires look so neat? Oh we spent like two hours on attaching four wires and you can take your time and bend them properly. <laughs> Even eight wires is progress. Yes that's how I see it too. So let's continue with this video and let's start with the next eight wires. <coughs> okay, we do that next. Okay, I, oh, what did I do? I think somebody mentioned last stream or so that Ben is actually making a mistake uh, here with the ALU and that's why there's a troubleshooting video afterwards, I think where he's correcting it. So I'm wondering if we not run into this issue because we verify the diagrams as well, or if we are as blind and confused as Ben, I guess, and uh, still and, and make the same mistake. I, so I'm curious about that. Okay, so this is the pinout of the XOR registers, uh, XOR chips, This those are over here. And so now we need to connect the outputs from here uh, into the inputs, into the B inputs of here. Uh, favorite thing in the whole world if there's no computers? Uh, people that don't spam. I bring the doggy. I shouldn't have released him. Uh, he's a very cute Frito. Frito, they say you look cute. They say you look cute. Uh, thanks for the bits. Thanks for the bits, Pro GJ. What are your goals job wise five and ten years from now? I have absolutely no clue. I'm riding the wave. I just look what's happening, what the opportunities that are coming up. I don't really have long term goals. Or, I mean, I, d I just don't know how the technology evolves. Like, the technology the technology has changed so much in the past ten years. So, how would I know what I would do in ten years? 
maybe I will do AI blockchain security or something like this. You know, who the, who the heck knows what, what kind of... Oh my gosh, I'm such an idiot. Wait a moment. I talked the whole time that I wanted to connect these things in order and I managed to uh, connect it wrongly. This is three. This has to go... Oh my god. So this here is A4. This should be the first pin over here. But now, uh, I don't know, the bending is now too... Crap. I'm streaming and just chatting, exactly. If we if we have too much wires per hour, I, I have to stream in science and technology. So it would be illegal to be in, uh, in just chatting. And so we need to stay under a certain threshold to be able to be allowed in just chatting. Do you try to copy Ben Eater's architecture? We are literally copying and following Ben Eater's video series, correct. One wire per hour. I think the threshold is a bit higher, but I need to uh, talk to my Twitch contact if, uh, if what what the actual limit is so how do you put code on the computer uh, later there will be ram and the program will run from ram and then you just need to write your program into ram and as far as i know in ben's original concept you just have to program that memory by hand uh, we might add some automatic way using like an arduino or something that could be a fun program pro uh, thing to do Oh, I cut this one way too short. I'm an idiot. Bring this man an auto wire stripper. Uh, there we go, automatorator blocking stripper again. Uh, I actually ordered one. It will arrive on Monday. The output's oh, what's happening? <laughs> There's nobody there. He was barking and freaking out in the same way he's freaking out when like a stranger comes into the apartment or so, or, or like the post rings. But it's impossible. He can't hear the bell from here. And I, I think so. There was also nobody at the door. And so I have no clue what triggered him. No clue what triggered him. Watch when he runs out of wire. This one is actually getting scarily low like this is like really little now but i have a second spool of these but yeah what podcast do you listen to do you listen to joe rogan oh my gosh i can't stand joe rogan did i make myself now a lot of enemies i know he's super popular uh i listen to a lot of podcasts so not sure uh what i could recommend but recently i've been really enjoying jason scott talks his way out of it Jason God talks his way out of it. He is behind the uh, textfiles.com or uh, te textfiles archive. He works at archive.org as well. And uh, he has a podcast where he's just like telling stories about his life, about archiving, about early hacking communities. He has an amazing episode about phone freaking where he talks about he has been, you know, been, he has experienced those times and stuff. Like it's super interesting and enjoyable he has an amazing voice cortex uh from you know uh mike hurley and cgp gray uh hello internet with um cgp gray and brady heron a german podcast about to keep up with politics is lage der nation is german so it's like you know german politics uh logbuch netzpolitik is also kind of political but also like it's it's coming from people that are part of the CCC, so it has a bit more of a, the digital angle. It's Nets politics or net net politics, internet politics. Oh no, Ross and Kerry! I really enjoy Oh no, Ross and Kerry. They are debunking, um, or they are like doing spiritual and religious and stuff like all all these kind of pseudoscience stuff. And then they do that and then they talk about their experiences with it. And, and then they uh, rate those things as money draining and 
uh, how pseudoscientific those things are. And it's super interesting because they they, they join different religious groups and go to several meetings and uh, tell the experiences. I think it's super entertaining. Planet Money. So, so a lot of the NPR stuff is great. Beautiful Anonymous is amazing by Chris Gethard. Uh, it's a phone call one hour with a stranger that is calling in and they just tell their life story basically and have this conversation. It's, it's very uh, awesome. I love listening to those. Beautiful Anonymous is great. Um, there's another science podcast which is also German called Methodisch Incorrect. They go over always a couple of papers per podcast. It's super long and they talk about each of these topics of these papers. Uh, it's but but that's quite interesting and entertaining. They are quite fun people. The Number File podcast is has kind of recently started by Brady Heron. He's interviewing different mathematicians mathematicians about their life, and he has, for example, also interviewed Cliff Stoll. Cliff Stoll is this guy from the Cuckoo's Egg who you know experienced this whole hacker story, um, and so he talks about his experience about that as well. So he should be a name if you are into security as well. And he is also the guy with the Klein bottles. That's where I ordered my Klein bottle from. So the number five podcast is also great. Oh, and the Unmade podcast also by Brady Heron. Uh, it's um, they 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 come up with stupid or creative podcast ideas, and then they think talk about if it's like a good idea or it's dumb idea and how that podcast would look like. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. I think these are the ones that I currently listen the most, but it also changes always over time. Oh, uh, Aufwachen podcast. Uh, I haven't, I haven't actually listened to that podcast, but uh, it seems to be also very long. But uh, yeah, Tilo Jung is an uh, amazing uh, guy. I watched the, a lot of his interviews and uh, YouTube videos and stuff, but I haven't listened to the podcast really. It, it always seems so long. But yeah, maybe I should check it, give it another chance. I only checked out one and that was too long and then I stopped. How far did you get today? Um, eight, nine, like 13 wires. We got 13 wires today. You should make a total wires count. That would actually be funny. Just count the, that would actually be funny. Maybe I check out uh, how I can do that easily with the bot. <laughs> that would be great. Do you have a lap bench power supply? Yeah, yeah, a, ch a cheap one, uh, like here. What do you think about the TUM? Uh, I have obviously not studied there, I don't know, but I know several people that are really good that are studying at TUM and they have an active CTF team that is also pretty good, or is also really good. And so, yeah, I think it seems like a good university with a lot of um, uh, opportunities there. You're probably spending more energy building that thing through burning calories than the thing itself while use over its lifetime. Yeah, probably. That's funny. Uh, what are the LEDs for? So these one are the current content of the registers. These two are register modules. So this is what is currently stored in those registers. These ones are simulating the shared bus right now, what is on the bus. And these LEDs up here are just status LEDs for the for the that's a clock module. This clear LED here is blue, and that's the actual clock output. And these three are like internal things for from the clock module. If like one of these cables underneath is not properly in, I would never be able to f tell that. Oh, look at that. Okay. That seems pretty simple. They're, they are not straight. I'm not sure if they match the same. Let's see for us. There, there are like two big things that I kind of learned and that, that I, those are the biggest things that I feel I take away with is first of all, w the first thing is demystifying these chips, these black magic things. What do they do? What are they for? What is in them? So understanding that all these chips is just a standardized package and they might implement different gates or different flip flops or like a few different things and that you can look them up and there's you can look up these part numbers and you can see what's in them and you can order whatever you need and uh, th there are different kinds of them like so demystifying these black chips that was a big one for me and made it interesting and the second thing is for example the 505 timer up here the fact that you can configure them 
based on hardware parts you put around them. So different resistor value and different capacitor values around this 5.5 chips uh, can control how fast this timer will create a clock, you know. And so be able, it's, it's almost like a function or a config file for a software, right? You can configure this hardware based on these hardware components. And I think that's, I don't know, that, that's kind of cool. So now we have connected the upper four and now we can need to connect the bottom four. And then that's the end of the stream. I have been eating for about an hour. How many wires have you made progress? What was your last state? We are currently at, are we at 20 already? I think so. I don't know how you have been doing this for so long without procrastination. Simple answer, because of the stream. Uh, the stream just keeps me like really concentrated and at it. It's uh, uh, some people would say ten wires in five hours. It's not exactly productive. Maybe some people would say it was heavily procrastinated. So maybe I take that back. Uh, clearly, if you watch this, I'm doing this with a lot of procrastination. I'm very slow in getting distracted by chat. That's I think the actual way how you should see it. Did you notice a boost in viewers from the video on the main channel? <laughs> Fuck! <laughs> Look at the viewer numbers. I've been streaming. You were there. Uh, Fuck, you were there. I've streamed to 50 viewers every day last week on average. And today when I advertised the video, I got up to 600 and we are still at 360. So yes, I notice a big boost of viewers coming from the main channel. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> No denying, that is all just coming from the main from the main channel. So here's one thing: I don't like to advertise stuff that I'm not already have completed or know I will be able to do. So so I kind of cringe always when like people like advertise like a new project with like the first video or something. Like they advertise, oh, I'm starting this new series, and they have only produced the first video. And they do that first video, they maybe do a second video, and then they stop. So I never liked that. Um, there's also psychological reasons about this. You have uh, the grat you get the gratification already at the start, and then you are not motivated anymore to do this. That's why I like to pre-produce my series, and I know that my series has already eight episodes. Like the Browse Exploitation episode, all the videos were already done in February. So I knew exactly uh, how many videos there will be, and I have it already done so that I know when I advertise this series, there will be the videos will be coming they are there and only then i get the gratification to actually release this i kind of failed with that rule for my mobile phone series and you already see the fail there i did advertise it as a new series and i only had like two or three videos made and then i wasn't able to do more or kind of stopped or procrastinated on it so i fell in the same trap that i usually don't try to do so for all the other series i did like very early on the binary exploitation series or the pwn adventure series or the angular js series and all these kind of stuff they were always like mostly done before i would even like introduce them for that particular reason uh yeah it's a, a general tip also to anybody who wants to create stuff uh, i know you want to get your work out there and you want to like tell people that you started this project and do it but uh, I recommend to do it first proof to yourself that you do it consistently, which I've kind of done like streaming last week every day without advertising it really much uh, to a few viewers only to see, okay, I actually do this consistently right now, so I can advertise it on the main channel is something that I do. Might still fail, but I feel more confident. But also with video releases, I want to have always these videos prepared before I get the gratification of advertising and then getting a reaction and stuff like this. Yeah, your GSM series didn't go far. Yeah, thanks for making me feel bad. I fucked up there. Something I admire from Ben's series was that he already had everything done so he could release episodes for like a year. Yeah, so for example, Ben pr finished, as far as I understand, Ben finished his computer and after that he made the videos about each step. So that's also good. He knew his goal already. He just had to like divide it up. I, th th if doing it that way, it also works. However, Ben also needed like two years or so, and there were stretches in between where he couldn't do that. He In the first video, he already said that uh, he might have to take certain breaks, that he doesn't have time and stuff like this. And Ben, this just shows Ben has some good discipline and some good goals. 
uh, that he wants to stick to and able to do that. But I generally I consider this kind of dangerous, and that you might procrastinate and not finish it um, if if you really release the first video even before having done like the next few videos. I want to order parts to build the CPU, but uh, Sketch will still fuck it up. Um, I think it's pretty doable. It's pretty easy. You might want to get a multimeter to for a bit of debugging as well, but otherwise easy. But what you could do, you could maybe just go step by step, module by module. Then either even you can, I think, get the kits module by module. So if you're worried about like not wanting to spend $200 already because you think you will ditch it, start with only the clock module. Build the clock module. It's like three five, five chips, here are three gate chips, uh, a, a type of wire, three LEDs, a couple of resistors. Like the, the, the clock module itself costs like, with the breadboard, okay, with the breadboard, maybe $15 or something you can get it. Maybe all, all together, maybe a bit more, maybe 20 because you need a whole spool of wire or something like that. But you could get with that pretty cheap. And then you can build that and you, then you see if like, the process is fun to you. And then you can always extend it with more modules. Uh, okay, so I think we need to add the yellow wires next and let's just do this. It's Sunday. Today was a special stream because I kind of, you know, announced it on, on Live Overflow. So so let's do this. Let's celebrate with that. But I do need to go to the bathroom uh, really quick first. And then I finally can also grab a mate. It should be cold now. So I will be right back in a moment. My goal is to is to start focusing on the... Yeah, so I'm back. Um, See, he just said he has he has to travel now and um, he is not sure when to release the next video. So I find that as a content creator myself, really brave to say that could go horribly wrong and you will procrastinate and never finish it. So kudos to Ben to still be able to stick through it and, and get it done. But uh, generally my advice for anybody who wants to do something, <laughs> prepare those things first and have these videos lined up before you start releasing them uh, because Releasing such a video and the gratification you get back from the reaction will already reward you uh, psychologically and that will demotivate you uh, of, of actually uh, doing it. Uh, I've experienced that and observed that a lot myself. It's a typical psychological effect uh, that people have. And so that's a uh, good advice. I, I think that's I think it's actually very important. I don't like to have people work for free when I try to be commercially successful. You know, when I try to earn money through YouTube and Twitch and stuff like that, uh, I think it's absolutely exploitative to then have people work for free as mods in Twitch chat, on YouTube chat, or even, you know, Discord moderation, stuff like this. Uh, I think that's exploitative. Half people would be happy with shouting out the Instagram account. Well, then I will be the first person to tell you that this is not enough payment. That's worth your your time is worth more than that. If people want to support you and can't do it with Patreon or sub or anything else, to be honest, if people, anybody who can't, doesn't feel like being able to pitch in five dollars, should not waste working and supporting me that way. Uh, that means you, the system is already treating you bad and not paying you well. Uh, so I would rather have you, uh, have you learn from my videos like that, and you rather invest the time and energy into other educational efforts and whatever to uh, move on or put that money up for up uh, to something else uh, to better your life in a way. And then when your life is better and when you get a good job, then you can pitch in. I think that's a better way to do it. How do you deal with the stress of two jobs? <laughs> uh, yeah. it, it is basically two full-time jobs. I don't have weekends or anything. I haven't had a weekend in like years and I haven't had vacations in like a year. Like yesterday was a first day in a long time where I didn't really work or do anything and went just out with friends. Uh, I basically feel like as long as I keep running, the burning coals on my feet are not hurting. <laughs> Does it make sense? Just keep running. Don't let it catch up to you. The problem is I cannot 
take a small break because my freelance work is directly correlated with, with my time to work and earn money. And um, uh, like this YouTube stuff uh, has also, or like this whole stuff has a constant upkeep or there's always more work you can do. You can always try to make the videos better, try to make more videos. Uh, you know, they'll always uh, try to uh, spend more time on a project to make that project better that the video is based on. There's always more stuff you can do. And so, so when, when the result is directly correlated with your work time, it's very, very difficult to take time away from that because it always means either you earn less or the quality goes down. And those are two things that are not fun that I don't want, you know? So you feel guilt. If I take a day off, I feel not necessarily guilty, but I know that I'm losing money right now. And, or that's the way how I feel. I feel like I'm losing money right now and I could make other stuff better and uh, the quality is deteriorating because of that. Also, I have a master thesis I should be writing. So that's a third thing, you know, that is, should have priority right now. Like I said, if you if I give free content and you want to give back uh, for this free content, what I'm saying is like if you are a student, like your money and time is worth more if you invest it somewhere else. You shouldn't waste your time, in, your time into like modding for for my channel or something like this. I think your time is better spent elsewhere. Uh, and that's my assumption why you are not being able to afford, you know, a bit of Patreon or a subscription on Twitch or something like this, which is totally fine. But I then would rather not take your free labor and exploit that for my business. I would rather have you invest that time into something else. And maybe in a year or longer when you have a job and you have disposable income and then you are able to, you know, support a bit on Patreon, I would much rather have that. Let me do that just to make this a little bit neater. Obviously, ben totally Eater. optional. Neither, huh? So we can connect B four to B three. <coughs> Sorry, it was just an excuse to dab. You are right. How do you test to make sure each individual module works? Uh, so testing works by connecting everything, plugging it in, and then. Our first test is to see if any smoke appears. If no smoke appears, we test if anything gets hot. And if nothing of that happens, we check if the functionality works by trying it out. And then it either works or we give up. But no, I don't really use these platforms at all. I'm generally actually very critical of bug bounty as well. This goes back to labor exploitation. My biggest uh, concern with uh, bug bounty is that it's uh, labor exploitation in the way how uh, it's ran on these large scale systems like Hacker One or Backrun. Why do you get sponsored by SSD if you are skeptical about bug bounty? There's a difference. I, I'm absolutely for bug bounty. I kind of want to make a video about this at some point. I need to properly resource more. I have nothing against bug bounty in general. I have nothing against paying for vulnerabilities found. I have a problem with a system that creates, that makes it look like it's a job. HackerOne and Bugcrowd make it look like a job. People that are engaging there make it like a job. People want this to be their job. People want to work, be a bug bounty hunter full time and stuff like this. And then you only get paid for what you find. You are not paid for your actual labor. Like all the time you're staring at code and testing and stuff like this is not paid. This is all unpaid work. Only when you find something that is paid. Now that is a, that can be how payment works. However, I find this very exploitative of, um, uh, of labor. Um, and this creates very interesting incentive structures. For example, if I find a core issue at, in some website, as a bug bounty hunter, I want to report every, let's say there's one core issue why there is an XSS and it could be fixed with a single thing. First of all, as a bug bounty hunter black box, I don't really can not really identify this, but let's say I would even be able to identify that there's a core issue. 
as a bug bounty hunter have the incentive to report every single occurrence of that XSS as a single thing. And I hope that uh, that the customer, like the person, that the, those developers don't realize that it's an underlying thing and they pay me for each single of that in ex in, instead of like telling them, hey, you have a dozen uh, things because of that one root cause, for example. So it creates like these kind of incentive structures. People are lying about sec issues. People are make securities up. There's also this problem of bug inflation. So a cross-site scripting issue can be used to elevate privileges, right? If you have an XSS and an admin backend and you are a regular user, you could XSS the admin and thus you could become admin. So in a sense, yes, it's a privilege escalation thing. But when you, but then you look into the classification of payments and you see that a medium and a high gets paid differently and then it says privilege escalation issues get paid more than XSS. Now, what do bug bounty hunters do? They don't report an XSS, they report a privilege escalation, which happened to be done through an XSS. And I've seen that done on, for example, the Microsoft bug bounty program. There are tons of XSS reported as critical privilege escalation issues. And that is not, that is technically true, but I think that's the, the only reason why this happened is because of this incentive structure of inflating your own bug because that means you get paid more. And uh, all these kind of structures I think are, are bad. But of course, bug bounty in general is awesome. It's, I'm glad that uh, people can uh, get their research paid for and stuff like this. Does that make sense? Yeah, I wouldn't necessarily say that my morals are only about the pe people's time. In, in a certain way, yes, I would say, you know, I understand that, you know, the world of capital works a bit differently and it's totally fine to reward success. However, you know, just on a very core human level, if you just ignore the world, human life is extremely precious and every person's life and time should be valued. Uh, and, and so if you have, you know, so there are certain jobs that pay a certain baseline, but then, you know, you get more if you are succeeding with the sale and stuff like this. I guess that's fine, right? It's just important that a certain baseline is met. If you are a bug bounty handler and you get sick, or all this kind of stuff, all your payment drops. There's a reason why society and countries have developed safety structures and insurances to catch people when stuff gets wrong. You know, okay, I'm not talking to you American people, but in Germany, for example, we have health insurance, social health insurance that helps you, you know, that to protect you. We have uh, welfare and all that kind of stuff because we recognize the value of humans uh, that, that every person has a right to live a dignified life and that's very important to me and so it's maybe a bit extreme to call then a qualified bug bounty hunter who chooses to do that kind of work you know you know uh, I don't know do you but can I get that I, I'm not like I just think these are in, important things to think about and to consider that's why I'm generally a bit critical of bug bounty but obviously I'm not super like opposed to bug bounty that's also why I advertise SSD because in principle I have nothing against bug bounty I have just a problem of it being made into a job uh, and especially you know the goal of security is basically to get rid of our own jobs uh, if we do our job perfectly well there wouldn't be any security jobs anymore kind of thing right so as a bug bounty hunter your incentive is to lower the amount of bugs in a platform but by doing that, you are lowering your own pay. And so I am i don't know what the better system would be. I don't think necessarily that they don't have to do much, but I do worry about like this advertisement, this marketing around this to be a cool job, you know, like the cool bug bounty hunters that earn millions just sitting at home doing bugs. And this is their job. Like that, that marketing I criticize. Does that make sense? It's just like, it's more like a marketing issue. And HackerOne and BugCrowd, they are companies, right? They want to increase their revenue. So just because they are a company, that's not the fault of the people there. It's just the, <coughs> the capitalism incentive structures that we have that they want to increase revenue. And they do that if they get people into that marketing to like you're loving bug bounty, you know, as a job and, and, and see these rockstar hackers up there that you know earn uh, money with that and stuff like this if they can get that marketing right that means that they will get a lot of free labor or very cheap labor 
if you think about the money they pay out and the hours that are going in, this is incredibly cheap labor that they are getting. Incredibly cheap labor. And if you see that as an average over thing, you know, that can be criticized because they are directly benefiting of that cheap labor that they are able to get through this kind of marketing. Uh, it's not the fault of individual people. Uh, um, and of course, I'm not criticizing anybody who is participating in Black Bounty and wants this to be a job or has this as a job. I have several friends who do this as a job. Um, you know, th th there's no criticism there. But I do think we as an industry, we can do have a critical look at these things and there are different arguments. And in the end, you know, like I said, I'm not against it. Uh, I do think there are just a few things we need to pay attention to because and, and just accept the facts kind of thing you know it doesn't mean you need to demonize it or something i hope i was able to express this uh well i don't know uh what do you think about serodium buying exploits without telling buying for yes so for example so f with something like serodium in overall it's not something i personally want to be engaged with uh, i wouldn't want to advertise for example a bug bounty program like serodium on my channel because I do worry about the uh, the human rights violations that could be done through that. Um, the problem is it's a trust thing. We don't know. We don't know who they are selling to. We don't know what they are used for. We might never know. Uh, but just in principle, it's something I generally want to be a bit more careful about. However, at the same time, I'm also not judging any researcher. In the end, any researcher wants to earn money. Uh, researchers might come out of countries with not a lot of um, uh, um, opportunities. And, and to be honest, walking away from 100K or 200K or even a million dollar, you know, for something, just to walk away and not take that money and give it to cheap to like Apple or for free to Apple because they don't have a bug bounty or stuff like this. Uh, that means you already have a good paying job and stuff like this. You know, there are people that walk away from that kind of money, but they already do quite well for themselves. But if you are somebody uh, who, you know, might not have a good job or something like this, and this is your way how you can have a good life, absolutely not judging you. I understand, you know, like on a personal level, uh, look out for yourself. That's, I think that's morally justified. In, in some maybe maybe not but I do feel for you I do have empathy for that uh, but yeah oh don't get me into please into uh, reports drama so far most reports that I've seen that are not being paid and then later patched were actually kind of bullshit issues stuff that yeah sure you could maybe change that but I wouldn't qualify them as vulnerabilities and I don't think they should fall on the bug bounty thing uh, yeah my gosh, it must suck to be a triager at these places. You get so... Okay, and I know a couple of people that have triaged for various bug bounty programs. And they are telling the kind of shit you get reported. All the time, so much crap. People just don't understand what a security vulnerability is. It's absolutely incredible. It's unbelievable what kind of reports are coming in. So that they are short-tempered uh, and maybe sometimes make mistakes. Absolutely understandable. But so far, I have not seen any report made public that is refused to be paid that I would also qualify as a vulnerability and wasn't paid. So far everything that was declined uh, was shit stuff. If you remember, if you can find that Uber report you're talking about, for example, we can have a look together and I give you my opinion on if I think that's a valid security issue or not. The pro does not implement multi-factor authentication resulting in the ability of an attacker to enumerate millions of OAuth to rider and driver tokens. I don't understand what he's saying. Is he just saying he's brute forcing OAuth tokens? But or I'm not sure exactly how the token format is, but I would assume that doesn't matter at all because OAuth tokens are super long and you can't enumerate that quickly. I mean, lack of rate limiting is kind of like an informational bullshit issue. I wouldn't expect anybody to pay for that in a bug bounty. The Uber customer promo endpoint does not implement... Wait, how is that not the same issue? I'm confused. Why does it need to implement multi-factor authentication? That I don't understand. Like an OAuth token, if you have an OAuth token, you are authenticated. I don't understand what this has to do with multi-factor. And then there's rate limiting. 
Yeah, well, I, rate limiting is another thing like meh thing. I'm not quite sure, but maybe I understand wrong. Okay, so there's a big difference for SSL. First of all, the lack of certificate pinning I personally find also mostly a bullshit issue because we don't have certificate pinning on on web browsers or anything like that. I find it rather curious and surprising that a lot of apps implement certificate pinning because in, on the web we don't have it. I think it's a nice to have. It's something I would also generally maybe mention as an informational or just like a recommendation. But the lack of certificate pinning I would generally not consider a vulnerability because generally SSL works that we have a certificate store on the phone and if you can add your own certificate to that the request should be valid. Personally I'm actually super annoyed at certificate pinning all the time because I think it makes the researcher's life a bit harder and doesn't really add too much benefit in my opinion. So if he says is accepting self-signed certificates I wonder so if the app would silently ignore SSL errors and would allow any certificate that would be a problem for man in the middle that would be a vulnerability but because he's mentioning it here in combination with certificate pinning, I assume what he means is that he added his own um, root certificate to the phone and then the connection was accepted. And that I think is not a security issue. Now that might be in violation of, uh, of Uber's rules in the bug bounty treasure map. If, if Uber says we want to know about certificate pinning, then yes, that is an issue. If, if Uber themselves say we value, we want this because Threat model always depends on the customer, depending on what kind of, what what it is about, right? There might be risky places where yes, you want certificate pinning and this, you would even consider that a vulnerability because the stakes are so high. So if Uber themselves say, this is actually something we care about, then yes, I would say that. So I don't think that's a vulnerability. That's again, like an informational thing because with that, you can't do much. It's like a recommendation thing, right? Like even getting the OAuth token in the first place is rather hard uh, and then not being able that that thing expires or uh, can be revoked by the user. Uh, yeah, you know, I would do that like a mis miscellaneous kind of informational thing. I wouldn't classify that as a vulnerability. I would put this as kind of like a recommendation or something that they could handle differently. See, like this is the kind of bullshit. Yes, it's a CSP violation. Uh, generally like whitelisting in CSP, something like this is rather unfortunate and is a bypass. What we see here is a general issue of CSP. CSP has turned out to be not practically being able to deploy it on large web applications. Uh, CSP has kind of failed for that uh, matter. CSP is a great mitigation tool if you are able to implement it, but most big sites fail because of because they have to wipe the stuff like that and then CSP fails. So it's a good CSP bypass. It's kind of like an informational thing. Uh, generally, like even Google can't manage to properly set uh, CSP because they are, have so complex web applications that they fail and you have constantly bypasses for CSP. Um, so even Google can't get this right. Uh, not right, they know how to do it right. It's just not impossible. The engineering effort is not possible. They would have to break their web application. They would completely have to redesign every, like it doesn't work. It's broken from the start. And so considering a, this to be considered a critical severity finding on a CSP3, this is just inflation. It doesn't make any sense. Yes, it is kind of a thing that could be mentioned, but maybe they can't get around to that right now. It's not a direct issue. It's like a defense in death issue. That's the thing. If you have an XSS or something like this, then uh, this would and could have maybe blocked it or not blocked it and stuff like this. So pff, yeah, not really an issue. But here's also a good example for why bug bounty sucks. Under these things, like these are not vulnerabilities. As a bug bounty hunter, you're not paid for this. These are not really vulnerabilities. However, as a security consultant, giving like advice on small things that you can improve, things that are kind of like bad uh, and um, are kind of like issues, but not necessarily security issues, and they are very limited and narrow and er edge cases and stuff like this. This is where you put them into the report as an informational and you report it and you all, but you get still paid for it. Um, and clients oftentimes say, yeah, we know, or we didn't know, but we don't care. And that's fine. You have to accept that. Uh, 
and that's not really what you can get out of bug bounties. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I mean, maybe there was like one issue, like maybe the, if as, so far the most useful issue I see in here is the certificate pinning. If Uber themselves say they care about certificate pinning and he clearly found that lack of security pinning, then yes, for sure. I think maybe here, maybe then Uber, if that's true, if that's the case, then Uber dropped the ball there, I would say. Why should I change the title of the stream? We are clearly, we are clearly building this here. Of course we are. We have never done anything else. Oh, the clear, the clear wire. So this, this is to clear the register. Uh, I think that should be it, right? Yeah, yeah, you should be jealous of my work ethics. It's incredible. The discipline I'm showing. You should take me as an example. Okay. I'm kind of scared. I'm a bit scared. Are all cameras and eyes on the circuit? Because I, I'm going to turn it on now. And uh, I worry we have built a short circuit or something. Okay, so please everybody look. It might go up in flames. One second, one second. Are you guys ready to turn it on? I'm nervous. We need to, oh, we, we forgot the clock signal. We forgot the clock signal. Let's put back the clock signal. Heavy now, really, plugged in everything. And have we plugged in everything correctly? Or will it all go up in flames when we turn on the power? Unfortunately, I have ordered a FLUR camera, a thermal camera to measure the heat. If we had that now, we would be able to see when chips are heating up and about to break. But are you ready? Okay, nothing seems to get hot. It seems all good. Seems all fine. <coughs> oh, the current is limiting already. I have too many LEDs. Okay. Okay, so this seems to... Wait, why, why is this off down here? Uh-oh. What happened? These were glowing a moment ago, right? Oh, I think they just got accidentally... Oh yeah, I want, this cable is just dodgy. This is the clear cable that is clearing the register. Uh, and um, somehow it's disconnecting and, and, and dodgy. Let me try a different cable. Wait, theoretically... If this is all ones, and here are all ones, if we subtract one from the other, the output should be all zero, right? Okay, here's one LED not glowing. That No, wait, two plus, plus, oh, that might actually be correct. Let me do subtract one from another, then all of them should turn off, right? That means I have to change with this input uh, if, if we enable subtraction or not, right? They are all off. And all ones plus all ones should all one except the last one should be a zero because one on one, you know, one plus one is one zero, so one zero, and then we have a carry that falls off. That actually looks good, right? Oh, yeah, I, I connected them wrong here. So disconnect one, now this should be a one. Okay, so we have a one in here. One plus zero is one. With the next clock cycle, we will we should move a 1 into this register. There it is. 1 plus 1 is 2. It's 2. Oh, wow, wow, this is incredible. I think. Wait. 
Let me enable the... Oh, wait, what did I do? Oh, I accidentally reset the thing down here again. Okay, wait. I can enable the output. Oh, I didn't connect the bus. I'm an idiot. Wait, let me connect these over to here. To... Oh! I caused a short circuit. Thanks for the prime sub, Ogden. Okay, why did I cause a short circuit there? Plus, plus, plus. Input disabled. Uh, maybe let's disable the input here. Why did I cause a short circuit? Why is this LED glowing? These shouldn't be glowing. Holy shit, why are they glowing? Wait, wait, wait. Oh shit. These wires were dangling in. Oh shit. Okay, that was a bad idea. Let's unplug these. <laughs> okay, now I know why the short circuit happened. They touched with their tips into the power rail there. Maybe you heard it clicking. Uh, this was the power supply here that uh, has a current limiting in built in. So it will shut off uh, when... Ah crap, now I don't have zeros anymore in it. Ah, shit, 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 shit. Okay, so now the output here is also connected. So we should be able to end... Uh, this is so dodgy here. Okay, let's enable the output. Okay, now it's outputting here. Okay, wait, let me think. <coughs> if we, now we output this. If we enable the input here, we execute the clock cycle. It should move what is ever on the bus into here. Oh my gosh, see that? See that? So this is carry, okay. So this is the output, this is the result. So first of all, the addition is correct. So we have 1111001. Okay, so, so we have 255 plus 250. It's basically a minus one, right? So this is 249. So my one adding 101001 is basically calculating a minus one. If you don't understand that, uh, watch the Who's Compliment video from Ben Eder. We are calculating minus one of this here, this value here, which is currently 249 or something. 249 minus one, the result of this is currently stored in here. And this is output to the bus. And the B register right now is set to read its value from the bus with each clock cycle. But that is the result that is in there. So with each clock cycle now, uh, the ALU is constantly doing uh, this value in here minus one, and the result is put out onto the bus. So with each clock cycle, it will read the result back into the register. Read this back into a register, which means now on the bus, the result is minus one. With the next tick, it reads that value in, it does the minus one, puts it onto the bus. With the next clock cycle, it will put the new value into the register the ALU will perform minus one, put that onto the bus, and then we have the circle. So with each clock cycle, we should be able to consistently cycle through these values here. Basically minus one constantly executing. And now let's switch to the automatic clock, and then we can watch it. Maybe I should also lower the light a bit. <coughs> This is the first time that this thing is doing something by itself. Super slow clock. And now let's slowly speed up. This is just binary uh, minus one, minus one constantly decrementing. Look how fast it's going now. Now it's so fast, you can't even see, see the clock pulse anymore. And see how fast it's now calculating. Every time this LED basically goes off and on again, we have subtracted 255 times. Amazing, exactly. 
What's the frequency? It should be uh, 500 hertz right now. So 500 times per second it counts up, which makes sense. So that means 500 hertz, we have 255, that should mean it manages to count through all 255 subtractions uh, twice per second. So this, you should see it turn on like two times per second, basically. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So that should be roughly a second. Because the stream has been so great today, because so many people are still watching, uh, I've been already in it for seven hours. Fuck my life. So why not uh, finish this off with a, with at least using the oscilloscope to measure the uh, the clock frequency again. We have done this before uh, on stream, but uh, I feel like that that's a good way to celebrate uh, celebrate today. So let's do that. Uh, let me turn on the oscilloscope. I guess we can plug it in here. That's the clock. There we go. We disable channel two, the blue one. We don't need the blue one right now. So this is the clock. Let's scale it a bit differently. Now let's turn up the hertz. You will see that these pulses will get now narrower. Now they are very narrow. So I'm zooming in now a bit more so we can see it better. Uh, let's turn up a bit more. This is now 500 hertz. You don't see it on stream, but there's like the up here, this bar that you can see here. These are various measurements that it, that, that it shows me of this signal that it sees here. So it measures 500 hertz right now. And for example, it sh also shows stuff like Maximum volt it shows here is 4 volt right now, 3.84 volt. Um, the amplitude from lowest to highest is around 3 volt um, and stuff like this. So it shows like various different things. The period also in milliseconds, so it's like a 2 millisecond period, that's 500 hertz. Uh, and actually we are finishing up because we built this circuit today. We built the ALU. So just recap what we finished up today and then we wind down the stream. Basically a minus one. So if you do this plus this, this is basically like doing minus one of this value here. The register down here is reading the result back in. It will calculate the next result, which is automatically put here. And with the next clock cycle, it pulls in the next result. Effectively with each clock pulse, doing a minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one. To wind down the stream, there's one important thing to do. As you may have seen on the Live Overflow 2 YouTube channel where I upload stream highlights, you have seen my makeup tutorial uh, because uh, I'm wearing makeup uh, for the bright lights to not have shiny skin. At the end of your day, you also have to get the makeup off. Uh, otherwise, you shouldn't sleep in that. It's not good for the skin. So let's clean off. Uh, to do that I'm using here some uh, wet wipes and so I'm just gonna uh, clean off the makeup. Oh it's like powder. It's like not proper makeup. It's powder. Actually I didn't see that much on it. I still need to practice. It's just a little bit uh, powder on here. But either way cleaning your face is important when you apply that stuff. I think this is the part for the girlfriends that sit next to their nerds right now. <laughs> Why are you not wearing makeup is the is the real question. Ah, uh, there we go. It looks pretty clean now, I guess. Got that powder off my face, I guess. So thanks so much for hanging out with me tonight. Check out the this is all based on Ben Eater series, so check it out on eater.net. The Primage. Okay, so I'm hosting the Primage. Thanks so much again for hanging out with me. Uh, see you hopefully tomorrow. We made great progress today. H thanks for hanging out. Thanks for the subs. Thanks for the cheers. Uh, and uh, see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.